This video is gonna be on the different types of research and we can break it into two broad categories. One category is where you're actually doing something, where you maybe you're giving a trial of a new drug or a trial of a new procedure. This type of research we call experimental. Experimental, you're actually experimenting. There's some sort of intervention on your part. The second group of research we call observational. Here, here you're just watching. You're just observing. You're not doing anything. So you just observe. We'll talk about observational first. There are three types. There is case control. There's cohort studies. And then there is cross sectional. A great diagram I found online drew it as kind of a arrow, a timeline. And I'll show you why this is such a great picture in a second. But first let's talk about cohort. Let's talk about cohort studies. Cohort studies are when you take a, a group of people, a cohort, that don't have the disease, don't have any disease, so no disease. However, they do have risk factors for a disease. Do have risk factors. And the reason it's on the line that's pointing forward is because you kind of watch them through the years and see if these risk factors make them develop that disease. So I'll watch, I'll say, watch over time. Great example would be picking a group of smokers that don't have lung cancer and you kind of watch them over time and see if they develop lung cancer. You want to look at the risk factor, the smoking. In our case, it'll be smoking, right? And you want to say, okay, what's their risk of developing cancer because of smoking as opposed to people that don't smoke relative to people that don't have that risk factor. So cohort is great for measuring what we call relative risk. How important is this risk factor relative to people that don't have that risk factor? Relative risk, just a fancy way of saying that. Right, you're measuring that, that risk factor. Uh, the way I memorize relative risk is I, when I think of relative, I think of family, right? And I think of family history. If someone has a family history of, a, of myocardial infarctions, they don't currently have a heart attack, but they're at an increased risk of developing a heart attack. They don't currently have the disease, but they have risk factors and can de and develop it over time and can develop it over time. All right, so that's cohort studies. Next one is case control. Case control. Case control is literally the exact exact opposite of cohort studies. Whereas cohort, you get a group of people that don't have the disease. In case control, you get a group of people that do have the disease. In cohort, where you're looking forward, where you're watching them over time. In case control, you're looking backwards. It's retrospective. You look back in the patient's history in the chart. So look at history looking backwards what you're looking for is if they were exposed to those risk factors you're looking for risk exposure so cohort study we said uh, you get a group of smokers and see if they develop lung cancer in case control you get a group of people with lung cancer and you see if they were smokers you look back and see if they have any risk factors okay one of the things case control studies measure is, okay, the patient has lung cancer. What are the odds of that being due to the risk factors of smoking? Fancy way of saying that? Odds ratio. Odds ratio. They have the disease, what were the odds of that disease being due to the risk factors they were exposed to back, back in their history? All right. So we have one looking forward, one looking back. What is cross-sectional studies? What is cross-sectional studies? Cross-sectional studies looks at the present. So right, cross-sectional looks at the present day. It takes a snapshot of what is occurring right then and there and kind of sees, okay, who has this disease? It looks for the prevalence of the disease. One of the most important things you should know about cross-sectional is that 
you get a group of people regardless of disease, regardless of risk factors, regardless of anything. You just take a snapshot. You take a snapshot of everybody. All right, that could be a five-year-old, that could be a 70-year-old, that could be a smoker, that could be a no-smoker, non-smoker. So you take a snapshot of the population. Okay, so I'll write, co I'll write group is, is gathered regardless of exposure or disease. Regardless of risk or disease. That's a very important thing you should know. You just take a snapshot of everybody and see who has that disease. I've seen a, a question talk about cross-sectional studies where, where they're looking at smoking and cancer and they say, okay, gather a group of people for this cross-sectional study. And most people want to gather people that, you know, want to gather people that didn't smoke versus people that did smoke. They want to gather those two groups of people and kind of compare and contrast them. That's not the case for cross-sectional studies. In cross-sectional studies, you gather everybody, regardless of the risk, regardless of the disease. That is the traditional observational studies. Now, there are some miscellaneous ones that kind of fall in this category. There's something called a twin study. This is when you look at a set of twins and then determine whether or not a disease is genetic. Yeah, if there's a genetic component to it. So in schizophrenia, if one twin has it, there's a high chance of the other twin having it. And that's how we did, that's how we figured out that some diseases have a genetic component to it. We look at twin studies. Another one is called the adoption study, where one twin is adopted to one group of parents, and then one twin adopted to another another family. And then you can compare and contrast what are the disease prevalence of these two twins. And that kind of shows nature versus nurture. Maybe one. You know, one family is really active and likes to work out, and then one family is sedentary, eats a bunch of junk. Okay, how does that affect disease processes? All right. That is the adoption study. These are observational studies. Let's talk about experimental studies. We're actually doing something. Again, you might be given a drug or a new procedure or trying something new. You're experimenting, You're doing some sort of intervention. And there are many ways you can mess this up. Many, many ways. In our next video, we'll talk about some of the ways that we commonly mess it up. Uh, some ways to reduce that is to randomize your volunteers. You want your groups to be random and kind of the same. You don't want one group to be way different than the other group. You know, you don't want that, so you randomize your groups. Another way you can reduce the ways of messing up uh, experimental study is by comparing the group that you're experimenting with to a group that isn't experimented with, a control group. You want to have a control group, we call that controlled. So the gold standard for experimental studies is something called randomized control trials, or RCT. Now you know why we do it the way we do it. it kind of decreases the ways of messing up this very important study. There are, kind of subcategories of um, experimental studies. There's something called a uh, crossover study. Crossover. So we talked about one group that gets experimented on compared to one group that doesn't, the control group, right? In crossover studies, members of the group from the experimental study will cross over and now be in the control group or vice versa. And by kind of jumping ship, you get a better idea of whether the drug is effective, whether it's placebo, all this great information. That is a crossover study. The name kind of gives it away. You're kind of crossing over, right? You can have something called meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is, meta-analysis is one of the more important and powerful studies because it gathers different randomized control trials and pulls them together. When you pull them together, you get a bigger sample size, and anytime you get a bigger sample size, makes things uh, a lot better. So, pulls similar trials together, increases your sample size. Fantastic. Now, last talk, you might be saying, well, I see randomized controlled trials for new drugs all the freaking time. And I get all excited, they're thinking of making a new drug that cures cancer, a new drug that cures HIV, all this stuff you see in the news, but then they never turn out. They kind of get lost. What happens? What, what happens between finding the new drug and then actually making it out? Why do all these drugs seem to just disappear? The reason for that is because a new drug has to go through this vigorous, vigorous testing process. 
It actually has to go through four phases. You might have heard, okay, a drug is now in phase two of, randomized, of a randomized controlled trial or phase three. That's what they mean, all right? You have to pass all these to make it into an approved drug. And a lot of times these drugs just don't make it all the way through. And that's why these drugs, you hear about it in the news and then you never hear anything else, okay? Let's talk about the phases. First phase is dealing with safety. Is the drug safe? You get a small group of people and then you give them a very, very, very small dose. You're checking for side effects. You're checking for the pharma kinetics and the dynamics you know, all that stuff, how the drug interacts with your body. You gotta make sure it interacts well. You gotta make sure the side effect profile is good, okay? Then you can see what dosages are, are useful for side effects and effectiveness. So phase one is all about safety, all about safety. Phase two is on efficacy. Now that you've established safety, you have to see whether or not your drug works. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty important. So efficacy, efficacy. This is where most drugs fail. Design a drug, you think it works and it doesn't really work that well. If you can make it past efficacy, then you see phase three. And that is, is it better? Is it better than the drugs we have currently? You could develop a drug, spend all this time and money into it, but if it's worse than the one we have currently, why, why bother, right? So this phase, phase three, determines whether or not it is better. So you compare it to placebo, you compare it to the standard drug that we give. Standard drug that we give. Makes it through all these phases, you get to phase four, the last phase. And this is dealing with the longevity of the drug. You monitor the drug over time. Monitor. And you look for any long-term side effects. That's very, very important. Very, very important. Because you can give a drug you can give a drug and it, all the side effects are, are mild, everything looks good, everything looks great. And then you realize 20 years down the line that drug caused cancer. You might have heard of a lot of these drugs when you're studying for USMLE. Drugs that get pulled off the market. Get pulled off the market because you realize there are some long-term side effects. Stage four looks for those long-term side effects. Okay, so those are the stages of uh, experimental trials. Now, how do they like to ask on the board? That's probably the most important question. They'll say a researcher made a new drug. And while testing the drug, the side effects were too great and they pulled the drug. What stage, what phase did they pull it in? Phase one, that's dealing with safety. Or they made a drug and it performed worse than the national standard. What phase did it fail in? Phase three, it wasn't better, it wasn't better. Or they made a drug, everything looked good, they approved it, they sent it out to the market, everybody's loving it, everybody's using it. 20 years down the line, they realized that it caused cancer. What phase? Phase four. And that's the way they like to ask it. Those are the different types of research studies. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks.